I'd like to welcome all of our candidates and the audience for being here this evening. I particularly need to say thank you to the Carroll County Times, to the Community Media Center, as well as WTTR for going beyond the required things to get information on the candidates out to the public. My name is Claudia Lewis. I am currently the president of the Carroll County League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters was uh, formed in 1920, about the same time that the efforts to get women the vote took place. Um, our mission is to improve government and to engage all citizens in the decisions which will impact their life. League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. It's a political organization. It encourages informed, active participation and works hard to increase the understanding and importance of public policy. The we, uh, league works through voter registration, voter education, and through advocacy. Uh, advocacy only occurs after study of a particular issue is taken very seriously. All sides are examined and then consensus positions are, t are formed. Once we have consensus, then we can actually advocate for a particular position. If we do not have an advocacy position, then we are not allowed to advocate for that particular issue. Tonight, we will hear from the candidates from District 2. Um, Mr. Jim Lee, editor for the Carroll County Times, will be serving as our moderator. Mr. Lee will be introducing our candidates and he will be explaining the rules of the forum. I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to also thank everybody for coming tonight. It's good to see so many people out and interested about the upcoming election and I thank the candidates for taking the time to be here as well. Uh, I am Jim Lee, I'm the editor of the Carroll County Times. <coughs> With us tonight is William Niner and C. Richard Weaver, two of the candidates in the District 2 race. The third candidate, Brian DiMaggio, uh, left a statement which I'll read for you. I apologize that I cannot be with you all tonight as I am in Mexico with my wife celebrating our 21st wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. That's my addition, not his. Uh, I promised her this trip long ago, and though I wish I could be there with you, I have a promise to keep. Sincerely, Brian DiMaggio. I hope they have a great trip. The rules for tonight's forum. The moderator will ask the first question. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. <clears throat> all candidates, excuse me, <clears throat> all candidates will answer the identical question. There will be no debate this is an informational forum. At the conclusion of the question period before the end of the forum for the evening, each candidate will have two minutes for a summary statement. The league will be timing the responses and will use cue cards and a bell to signal the remaining time. The timekeeper shall ring the bell two or three seconds after the final stop signal is given. And the moderator shall immediately interrupt the candidate and discontinue the statement or answer. At that time, the microphone will be silenced. Questions will be selected from those submitted in advance to the Carroll County Times, the Community Media Center, the League of Women Voters and Members, and from tonight's live audience. In addition, viewers of our live streaming program can submit questions during tonight's broadcast via the Twitter hashtag Carroll County, Carroll, excuse me, Carroll 2014. Hashtag Carol 2014. <clears throat> Tonight's forum is being recorded, so we ask that everyone turn their cell phones off. Please do that now. And that attendees refrain from applause or making noise during the forum or doing anything visible or audible to express support or opposition to any candidate during the forum. Those rules all right with you guys? Sounds good. So we're all set to begin. I'd like to start off the question. I've put a notice. Well, look, wait, I'm sorry. Dave 
take us three minutes oh. each to introduce oh. themselves. You know, I, I think I did this the last time, too. I just <laughs> didn't want to give them their introduction statement. All right. Um, we could start with Mr. Niner first with your introductory statement. Hi, I'm Bill Niner and a candidate for County Commissioner here in District 2. This includes Hampstead, Greenmount, Finksburg, Gamber, Smallwood, Snydersburg, and parts of Westminster. I was born and raised here in Carroll County and grew up working on my family's farm and learned early in life the value of hard work. I have volunteered for Congressman Roscoe Bart Bartlett, Senator Larry Haynes, Governor Bob Ehrlich, the Republican Central Committee, and on numerous presidential campaigns. As your county commissioner, I will work hard representing you and making sure your voice is heard. I will work to ensure that Carroll County values and views are preserved. There are several main issues that I will work on as your county commissioner. The first issue is accessibility. As county commissioner, I will make sure I'm accessible to every citizen. I will represent the people and not lose sight of who I'm working for. After all, I'm working for you. I will make time for anyone who wants to meet with me. Next, I will work to lower taxes. I will work to keep your hard-earned money in your pockets. That's right, I'll work to keep your hard-earned money in your pockets. I'll work to find ways to lower taxes for individuals, families, small businesses, and for our family farms. I will work to ensure that there is a true balanced budget and that Carroll County is business friendly. I will also bring fiscal responsibility to Carroll County. Additionally, I will work to protect our Second Amendment gun rights for protection and hunting. I will work to find solutions for our small businesses and family farms, which is the backbone of our community. I will stand up against Common Core so our students have a great education to prepare them for the trades, college, military, or the workforce. The parents, teachers, students, and the businesses in our community should, say ha should have a say in how our students are educated to prepare them for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, I'm Richard Weaver, running for the same uh, area. I had a planned speech uh, loaded with all the political jargon, but a wise man told me on the way in here, Dad, be yourself. <laughs> and I have to do that. Uh, my wife, my two sons and I, uh, operate a family farm in Fengsburg, encompasses about 400 acres, about 100 head of Angus cattle, and we work hard uh, with the farm. In addition, I retired after 38 years of education at North Carroll High School. I went to school at North Carroll High School across the street uh, when it was a high school. Started with the high school in Hampstead and retired last July. In those years, uh, I learned that we have to work together to get anywhere in our system. And one of the things that we need for our politi political system is working together. The commissioners need to work together. All agencies in there need to work together. Collaborative government is one of the major issues I'm pushing for. And that goes all the way through, uh, down to the person that meets somebody coming in the door. It has to be a positive atmosphere that we are working with the people of Carroll County. Government needs to work with the people, not run their lives. The second issue I wanted to deal with is public safety. As I've been around the county in the last couple of uh, months, I'm dealing with a lot of senior citizens. They are worried about EMT services. They are worried about uh, the fire service. They are worried about the police department. And here again, we have to collabor collaboratively, wish I could say that, uh, work together with uh, the fire service, the police to in, uh, bring the sheriff's department up as the primary law enforcement agency in this county. Um, from that, we need to uh, look at economic development. Jobs and job enhancement are the primary areas we need to work on. And if we can do that, the rest of everything falls into place. The housing, everything falls into place by the type of jobs we can offer. Um, I would like to say that uh, if we can work uh, for public safety, we can work uh, for uh, a top-notch education system, we can work collaboratively with the government, we will be in good shape in this government. I, I want to work for a strong economic Carroll County. Thank you. Thank you. So I jumped the gun. Now I can start uh, with questions. We, as I said, we've taken questions from uh, numerous different sources. I did post something on our 
Facebook page at Carroll County Times this morning. I said, we're having this forum tonight. Anybody have any questions? And there were only a few responses, but most of them had to do with education funding. So I figured we'll go ahead and just start off with that, since that's what people talked about this morning and earlier today. What's your commitment to education funding? Is maintenance a effort enough? Should it be more? Please explain your position. And Mr. Weaver, we can start with you this time. Well, education funding. First of all, the commissioners are in place to work with the Board of Education and develop a, a short range goals and long range goals as far as the needs of education. Uh, and we work with the Board of Education. This has to start very early working on all the budgets, all the planning for the next year, two years, three years, down to 15 years as far as where we're going to be. Uh, the budget's tight. And right now, we know that we're going to have to come up with creative ways to fund education. Uh, here, this drops back to economic development. If we can develop the small business jobs in this county, we can fund education. Now, we have to be thrifty. We know that. And in order to do that, we have to work with the Board of Education. Where can we cut? What are our needs? What can we take out this year? What can we put in next year or follow down the road three to four years? But this is going to be a tight uh, several years, and we know that. And we're going to see that uh, if we can work with our board, I think we can develop a long-range plan, short-range plan as far as schools, as far as funding, as far as what teachers need, uh, the uh, infrastructure for our computer systems, everything is going to be tied in, uh, I guess, with the uh, overall um, funds that we can bring into the county. I uh, think um, education is one of the top priorities in this election. It's going to be a major uh, part of our campaigns, and we have to support a top-notch education system. We're at the top of the state of Maryland, which is the top of the national uh, uh, level of education. We want to keep that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Niner? I think education is very important here in Carroll County. We have a lot of young folks coming up, and we want to make sure they're prepared for their future, whether they decide to go to the workforce, they go to college, or get into the trades. The question that we're asking about is educational funding. There's different theories that we can look at as how to fund education. What we actually need to do, student enrollment's dropping every year. It's going down because of the population size here in Carroll County of the young, younger people. What we need to do, we actually need to look and see how many students are going to be in school that year and then allocate an appropriate amount of money to fund their education. We don't want to overfund it and we also don't want to underfund it. We need to make sure the appropriate amount of money is allocated so that we can educate them with the cost, uh, cost to put them through school also, teacher salaries, we need to make sure we have funding for that also. Um, one of the things Carroll County Board of Education and here in Carroll County they've taken advantage of was Common Core. I disagree with that on the financial principle. One, the Amalia administration took $250 million from the federal government. Carroll County got one of the least amounts at $500,000. That's not even enough to fund the school, school education for our students. I think the parents, the teachers, the local businesses need to meet together and see what the appropriate funding is, what we can do, and I have an open door policy. I want to meet with those groups and see what we can do and allocate the appropriate funds. This isn't a time to be, it's 2014, the economy's tough, and we need to make sure we have a true balanced budget and make sure we have the appropriate funds for our students based on student population that current school year. It should be looked at every year. Thank you. Our next question, has expanding the commissioners from a three-member at-large board to five members elected by district helped to resolve county issues? Please explain your thoughts. And Mr. Niner, if you would go first. I think it's good that we have five county, county commissioners now. We have five different districts. Uh, you actually get to represent the district that you're, you reside in. Like here, currently, we have Commissioner District 2, which encompasses Greenmount, Hampstead, Finksburg, Gamber, Smallwood, and outskirts of Westminster and the parts throughout. Uh, it gives the people from that area a voice in that geographical area as to what's going on. But I do think it's caused some confusion as far as redistricting. 
I think if we have five commissioners, the whole county should be able to vote for up to five county commissioners. You should have one person representing that district. So everybody can vote for five county commissioners per each, five, each of the five districts. Uh, but I think it's good. We have a smaller geographical area and we can pertain to the needs of that actual district that we have. And here, I'm looking forward to working for uh, District 2 and also serving the entire county for Car of Carroll County and all the citizens here in our community. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, five, as we move to five commissioners, that's, that's, that's tough. This was uh, uh, the first time we uh, had an attempt to uh, work with that many commissioners. It's gonna be interesting. I do feel though, five commissioners can work just as effectively as three. I like the district uh, idea as far as getting to know the district a uh, little bit better. I do know the community in district two. Uh, I've learned to a lot of the business people have told me a lot of the things going on in this community that I really hadn't been totally aware of. But as far as the um, five commissioner districts, we have to, or five commissioners, we have to understand we're going to work as a group for everybody in the county. And you're only elected in your district, but now you have to start working together. You have to come up with a, uh, a cohesive plan and vision that you can now start to carry throughout the county. And this, we only represent 20% of the county uh, from this point of view, but I kind of like the idea to be able to uh, try to work with the other commissioners and put it together. I think I have the ability to do that. I think I can work with them. I can uh, easily uh, deal with those people uh, as far as the other four commissioners, and we can come up with uh, a good working plan to meet the needs of the county. I don't, uh, it doesn't intimidate me at all as far as working with uh, five commissioners compared to three. I'm sure in the future there's going to be changes, but right now this is, uh, we have to go through another four year cycle and try out the five commissioner system. Thank you. The next question comes from a member of the audience. Candidate Niner stated his commitment to work on solutions to lower taxes. How would he and the other candidate propose to do that without compromising funding for things vital to the well being of our community? And Mr. Weaver? Okay. Taxes are a burden to many people. And I found that out talking to quite a few of them lately. Uh, I pay my share of uh, property taxes as well. But if we can work through economic development, job enhancements and jobs, we can start to bring in extra revenue that will offset the need for um, increasing taxes. The other thing is, I've been doing quite a bit of research in the county lately, talked to a lot of C CEOs of companies, and county efficiency is the key. I do have a plan uh, that I have figured out I can save five to eight million dollars real fast uh, in just county efficiency, talking to people in the county. That offsets raising taxes. And I think I was told this is just the tip of the iceberg. The county is not the most efficient right now, and I think we can come up with a plan uh, and not have to raise taxes, and keep taxes lower, uh, and develop all the services we still need in this county. I'm confident this, will, this can work and can happen. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Okay. I understand that we need to have tax dollars coming into the county. That's what pay, pays for a lot of our services we have, like education, the roads that we drive on, and other services that we have here in the community. But we need to use the tax dollars that we have effectively and efficiently. Right now, there's a lot of government waste going on. We don't have a money problem in this county. I think we have a spending problem. We need to have a true balanced budget for the money that's coming in. We don't overspend what we have. It's just like when you're at home. You have your bills. You make sure you pay that. You don't overwrite a check or anything like that and go over your budget for that month. That's what the county needs to do, like you do your personal checkbook at home. Uh, I, one of my things is to keep uh, taxes lower is one, you don't raise them, you don't increase them. That, means income taxes, property taxes, also fees are concluded as taxes. There's a lot of discussion as far as increasing fees here in the county. We need to keep those lower. There's a lot of fees. They're talking right now about increasing the fees for liquor licenses for a lot of our stores. What that does, that increases the cost when the people go to the store or a bar to get a, a drink like a beer. I mean, a lot of times that helps fund their restaurant business, uh, just like Dean's Restaurant here in Hampstead. 
A lot of their business comes from their bar. If you increase the fees or any taxes on any of these businesses, all it does is increase the cost for what people have to pay. I want people to keep more of their money in their pockets, whether we can do a substantial amount or any little bit helps. If people have money in their pockets, they're going to be able to take their family out on a Friday night to get dinner, go to a movies. That's how you stimulate the local economy. You're going to put money back into the economy if you have it. Some people may want to save it. People want to pay their bills. People want a better life right now. The economy is in bad shape. We need to make sure people keep their money so they can support their family and take care of their kids. Um, the more money you have, you can pay your bills a lot easier, and you can also buy locally. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to have a follow-up question to go with that based on your responses for both of you to answer. Uh, Mr. Niner, you said we have a spending problem in the county. What specifically are we overspending on? And what specific areas would you focus on for cuts? And Mr. Weaver, do you think we're overspending? And if so, where? And if not, what would you do? Mr. Niner? The spending problem is that we got to work within our budget and within our means. Uh, one of the things is, I talk, we talked earlier about education funding. We need to make sure we're allocating the appropriate funds for the money we have. We don't want to overspend on education. We want the appropriate amount of money allotted to that issue, whether it's education or any. Road construction is another thing. I think infrastructure is great. Uh, we need to make sure the roads that we have are in good repair, but we spend the appropriate amount of money. We work with contractors and see what the best uh, offer is as far as getting things built and put up here in the county. And like I said, you got to work within a budget. The county, a lot of times, they get the tax dollars in and then they end up spending it. Uh, Carroll Community College is another area where they have a surplus. They're always coming in asking for extra money. We need to make sure more of that money stays in where we can use it. Uh, we don't need a surplus in areas, and I believe I've read something in the paper where the Carroll County school system has a, a surplus of, I think, around 12 to 15 million dollars. Uh, we need to make sure there's no surpluses. If you have effective use of your money and you're not overspending it, there's no surplus and there's no deficit. Thank you. Um, you know, we do have enough funds, I believe, in the county. We need effect effective, efficient government. And I don't think anyone has to lose their job there's no um, uh, major problem there. We just have to start spending less on some projects. We have some inefficiencies, and I've been made aware of quite a few of these, and I uh, will share them at the appropriate time. But uh, right now, we look at our whole package money. We have a, a lot of money. Some things it's hard to put a price tag on. Uh, and education is a, one of the issues, I guess. It is very hard to put a price tag on some aspects of education, enhancement of uh, enrichment of some of the areas. They take a little more money than some of the others. I know that we have to uh, not micromanage the Board of Education, though. We have to allow them to set their budget, and the commissioners have to fund what is needed. I think we, I know we can save enough money and just efficiency in this government to offset all uh, future uh, issues that we have. As far as the um, um, overspending, we have a tendency to spend what we have, uh, but I do believe that when you have a surplus and you don't spend what you have, you have the right to keep that uh, for, for something you're saving for, just like your personal budget. If you're looking at 5% uh, savings that you can save and put in your savings account, you save for that new car or the expense you're going to see down the road, you should be able to keep that fund and, able to, and use it when it's appropriate, not have to always give it back. And I think we can do that in the whole county. We have enough funding. Uh, we can lower taxes, but we can uh, have to get efficient. Thank you. Thank you. As long as we're talking about government spending, uh, we have another question from the audience. Would you support a new pension system for the sheriff's office to cost the county millions of dollars? And Mr. Weaver, you're first. Okay. The sheriff's department, you realize, is being restructured. They are now going to become the primary law enforcement agency in the county. This is new to us, and we're going to have to uh, work with the new sheriff that's coming in, and they're going to have to develop a plan uh, that, that's going to work for the sheriffs. As I said, law enforcement uh, and public safety is primary. Everybody wants to come to Carroll County. Our crime is low. 
We want to keep criminals fearing Carroll County. They do not want to come uh, to Carroll County. The officers that work out there, they put their life on the line, need to make a living wage. And it doesn't always have to be in dollars and cents. Uh, they need some type of program for retirement that they can uh, rely on. And how we do that, that has to come from the sheriff, the new sheriff, and we work together to come up with a plan. But they also, uh, besides just the, a pension for them, we have to start looking on how we uh, upgrade uh, through that. And I was uh, in the office talking to our present sheriff yesterday, and he developed a, a plan in which we can, uh, officers can work through uh, a pay grade. They have to perform in order to get there and uh, have a chance to get some additional funding or some more take-home pay uh, with them. The average, uh, I found out the average uh, officer makes 41000 and can be making that in 20 years. So they have to come up with a plan here on what they're going to need collaboratively. We have to work through it. We work together to come up with a plan on what, how we keep law enforcement here in Carroll County, how we keep uh, people uh, employed, and we keep a strong uh, law enforcement presence in Carroll County. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Uh, emergency of services are very important to me, and uh, the sheriff's office is actually our primary law enforcement here in Carroll County now. As far as a pension system for our sheriff's department, uh, the county government has a pension system and so does the state government. But one of the things when I looked at the state and the county government, there needs to be a period of time where what they call a vested period of time. Like you work so many years for the sheriff's department, say 10 years, and once you get that service in, you get vested for that. We don't want people just coming here for one or two years and leaving. We wanna make sure they're here long term so they get the experience in the position that they have in the sheriff's department. We wanna make sure they're here protecting our community, not just as a stepping stone, just to work here and then move on to another department. Um, I think if we have a, a, a great grading system as far as the, uh, the years of service that they put in, uh, we can look at that. If they get injured in the line of duty, I think we also ought to have something like that, like the military has. Uh, they put their, line, or their lives on the line every day. Uh, they give their wives and kids a hug, hug and kiss goodbye, and they go out and serve us. Um, they're busy every place I go. Even coming here tonight, I saw the county sheriff's office driving here on Brodbeck Road. Uh, they're working around the clock. We need to make sure our law enforcement's well taken care of, and I do agree with the pension system. But as long as it's well structured and detailed, and there is guidelines, nothing that's freelance. I think what needs to be written out and it needs to be approved by the county commissioners. And we also need to work with the uh, sheriff's department and people in law enforcement, including the Fraternal Order of Police or any other groups um, as far as advocates for the uh, police department. And we also need to look at what other counties are doing too, what's comparable as far as a pension system and also their salaries at the sheriff's office. Uh, a lot of people are getting underpaid that work for our law, for, uh, law enforcement and they need to be treated appropriately and they need to be paid fairly. Thank you. Our next submitted question, should Carroll County have a county militia and should public funds go toward that effort? And Mr. Niner, I believe you're first. Um, that's a good, great question. I, I, like we said earlier, we have the county sheriff's office as the primary law enforcement. We have the Maryland State Police. We have a barracks right there in Westminster on Route 140 in our district here in Commissioner District 2. Um, as far as, as expenses, I think we need to, and how we're going to fund things, I think we need to focus on the sheriff's office and also on uh, working with our uh, state law enforcement and other agencies that are currently in pl place. Um, I think it's a great question. It's something I would like to look into, but like I said, the primary law enforcement here is the county sheriff's office, and I look forward to working with them and our state police. And we also have the local police here, uh, Hampstead and Westminster and Manchester and other communities have their local police departments. So we have that there as far as security and protection also. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, uh, we do have plenty of law enforcement services in place. As Bill said, we have the local police, we have the state police, we have uh, uh, all kind of, we have the sheriff's office. We also have uh, a National Guard in Westminster. Uh, we have the Army Reserve if needed. Uh, a mili own county militia would be uh, a little bit too much, I think, for the county. Thank you. The next question. 
also submitted by a resident. I am a resident of Hampstead District 2. I am a Democrat, but switched my voter registration to Republican so I can vote for one of you in this primary. As a minority politically and in other ways, I sometimes feel unwelcome and unrepresented in Carroll County. What would you do to promote a welcoming atmosphere to those of us in the minority in Carroll, and how would you represent all the residents of District 2? And Mr. Weaver, you're first. Okay. You know, um, party affiliation uh, to some people is a very strong thing. To others, uh, I talked to a lot of students who registered. A lot of them registered as independents right out of school. Uh, a lot of them register for whatever reason. Well, my father was uh, a Democrat. My mother was a Republican. That's why I registered that way. They get later in life and they start to look through the, uh, uh, they get into politics a little bit. They start looking at what each party stands for and they make changes. Uh, there's nothing wrong with change as long as it's for the right reasons. A lot of people have a, a person that they want to elect and it may be in the other party. In the way we have the election set up now, they uh, have to change parties in order to do that. I, myself, have been, I was born a Republican. Um, I <coughs> never uh, knew anything else, but uh, let's put it this way, if you did change, uh, you should be welcome, like anybody else, to make those changes. People move from other states. They see the light, they want to change. Nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Niner. To make people feel welcome, as an elected official, you're here to serve everybody here in the community. I'm not a special interest politician. I'm here to serve the people in the community, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever you want to register as. There's other choices on the uh, voter registration form. Anybody wants to feel welcome? I tell people, accessibility is one of my key issues. Anybody wants to talk to me, they can call me on my personal cell phone. It's 443 five three six one four zero eight nobody else is going to give that out when I'm elected as county commissioner it will go on every piece of letterhead every business card if the county won't print it I'll buy my own letterhead and cards so if people want to talk to me and call me here people see me around in the community I'm at the fire department supporting them I'm out at the American Legion which I'm a member of the Kiwanis Club I'm here in the community you'll see me at restaurants oh, as big as I am I've been supporting the local restaurant community here for a long time so I do uh, put money back into the local economy and I make sure I get a good barber that makes sure I don't lose any more hair. So you can find me at any of those places and like I said, I'm here in the community and the main thing, you can contact me by email, uh, meet me in person. I'm always here to talk to everybody and like I said, call me on my cell phone. Go to my website, any way you wanna talk to me, that's fine. I don't have a business phone, you're gonna get me. So when you elect me, you're going to get me here. I'm passionate about this community, and I'm here to work for you, no matter your party affiliation or anything. So call me, 443-536-1408. I got it on vibrate right now, though. Yeah, please don't call him now. <laughs> Not now. Uh, very good, thank you. Our next question. Uh, support for nonprofits and critical human services have been severely impacted over the past few budget cycles. Since much of their funding is through matching grants, how do you propose handling issues that might arise if they are not funded? And Mr. Niner, you're first. As far as um, here in the community, I think we need to work on supporting our volunteer services and our community groups. I know there's been legislation down in Annapolis and we need to work with our uh, nonprofits and help them out. Uh, there was a bill recently down in Annapolis and then also came before the county commissioners to talk about what people call as the gaming bill. Uh, one of my things is I think it's a revenue source, um, a revenue source that we can have for the nonprofits to bring money into as long as it's controlled, like you pay an entry fee, not like a gambling casino or anything like that. I think that's one way that uh, you can generate revenue for the nonprofits. Uh, there are funds out there that nonprofits and community groups can get, whether they're grants. I'm willing to list that. I think it needs to be more information on the website, the Carroll County government website, or any government agency as far as uh, with the information on how to help our nonprofits and our community groups here. Uh, the nonprofits and community groups are the backbone of our community. Uh, like I said, I'm in a nonprofit with the American Legion and Kiwanis Club, and we do a lot of stuff in the Kiwanis Club for our, the children in the community whether it's restoring playgrounds or helping them and giving out scholarship money. That all comes from personal funds, and we raise that. So I think 
we need to support our nonprofits and our local community groups here, and I'm willing to do that. I volunteer my time continuously, whether it's on a large scale or something small, such as a uh, cancer calls or something like that to raise money for a cancer patient. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, nonprofits uh, encompasses a whole host of agencies. Uh, when I was a teacher, I referred many students, or we dealt with a lot of these agencies. They do a lot of good in this county. They're not cheap in order to run these agencies. Uh, I think here again, each agency uh, has a need. They see different needs coming up. Uh, we have to look at long-range plans, short-range plans on what their needs are going to be, and we have to allocate percentages to what uh, their their needs are going to be. I know one of the major needs is the computer updates that they're going to need in order to keep up nationally with what's going on. We're going it's going to fall into the commissioners to come up with a plan for this. And those many of those agencies do a lot of good for a lot of people. Uh, we can't turn our back on them. We have to keep them uh, going. But here again, this is a uh, economic issue. Uh, whatever percentage we can come in uh, with in the county, we have to spread that out evenly throughout the uh, nonprofits or by the need. And here, where we have to start planning short range and long range, what is going to be needed in these areas? Some of them need more than others. And private funding for some of these is also uh, a good. Uh, place to look for uh, increased funds. There are grants, there are state agencies. We work with our legislators in Annapolis to try to get additional funding. Uh, it's important that we have uh, these agencies. They do a lot of good. We don't want to overlook them. Thank you. Next question from the audience. What do you think of charter government and would you support a change to this form of county government? And Mr. Weaver, you're first. Well, first impression on this, I want to try four years without charter government at this time. We are doing fine at the present time. I think our five commissioner system can work together very well. Uh, if we can get together, work uh, in, uh, together on most of our topics, we're fine. Charter government is another step. We'll probably get there eventually. I don't think we're ready for that at the present time. Uh, we want to just started with the five commissioner system. We want to go through a second go round of that before we even make a decision uh, as far as uh, looking at uh, charter government. And my op opinion at this point, it's too early to deal with that. Thank you, Mr. Mo Mr. Niner. Unlike my opponent, I'm going to tell you I am against charter government. I think it means it's more government, bigger government. One of my campaign things is less government. It's going to cost more money to have charter government here in Carroll County. Uh, I said earlier, I think the five commissioner districts is fine for what we have here in Carroll County. You should reside in the geographical area that you're elected in, but I do think, to be fair to all citizens here in Carroll County, you should be able to vote for a, the people that are running per each district. So people and New Windsor should be able to vote for myself here in District 2. They should have a say because when you're working here as county commissioner, you should be working for everybody in the whole county. I'm here to, I, only District 2 can represent me, but I think District 1, District 3, District 4, and District 5 should be able to vote for me too as a county commissioner. So, but I do think the person that represents that geo geographical district needs to reside there, but people should be able to vote for Five commissioners, one for each of the districts. Thank you. I have a question that was emailed in. Nearly half the households in this county have access to only one, and in many cases, no wired high-speed internet options. Neighboring counties have multiple options, including fiber optic internet. There is no sign that this lack of choice will change in the future. As commissioner, Will you work to expand Carroll County government-owned fiber network to all businesses and homes and provide open access to any service provider wanting to offer service over that fiber? And Mr. Niner, you're first. Okay. I've actually been approached by this question when I'm out door knocking at the Hampstead Business Expo or at the fire departments helping out or even at the American Legion. I actually had a question last night when I was out there uh, at our meeting, it's once a month. Um, 
I think we need to look at the technology that's here in Carroll County and see what we need to do to improve it. If fiber opt optics is one of the ways that we need to do improve in technology because Verizon and Sprint's not investing money here in Carroll County based on what I've read in the newspaper and seen on the internet. We need to work with some of our local companies to see what we need to do as far as to get our businesses and households up to speed as far as technology so they're connected here in the community. Uh, in today's world, time is everything. So the faster we can get information back and forth to each other, I think is great um, because it may, technology with speeding it up may be able to save somebody's life, be able to get a business transaction through faster where timing's everything. If you have to meet a deadline and if you go old speed dial up like some of us have at our homes, it takes a little bit of time to get on your computer and move it forward to get that message out. So, and um, it looks like the way of the future, everything's gonna be high speed technology, whether we do banking uh, by internet or if we're emailing people, uh, everybody's going electronic. So I think uh, we need to look at that and see what the cost is and see what local companies, if there's a local company here, we need to work with that so we can keep the money here in the local economy. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, fiber optic net networks are a thing that it's here. We have to have it, we have to, for economic development. If we're gonna expand small business in this county, we need fiber optics, we need a uh, high speed, uh, internet we have to keep up with the times and that's also going to be faster and faster as we go through i am a proponent though of giving it to private enterprise let private enterprise come in as much as possible if they can put the system in uh, with the county uh, we should be able to develop an even better plan that we can continually upgrade uh, on a annual basis probably and it may even be um, by or uh, six months at the way the, uh, a lot of the technology is changing. It's critical to the county, it's critical to the fire service, it's critical to the sheriff's department, it's critical to every business out here that we have this in place. Otherwise, we will never get uh, the business into this county that we need. Thank you. As a follow-up to that question, because I do get a lot of calls at the times, um, from people, if you live outside the municipalities, chances are you don't have you're, you're on dial-up. If you're on anything else, the you, Mr. Weaver, you mentioned seeking out private enterprise. Private enterprise that has brought cable to the county to where we are today hasn't shown a whole lot of interest in expanding it. Their, the cost benefit analysis isn't there for them to go 10 miles between houses they're not going to do it. They've said they're not going to do it. You both agree technology is important. It's, you know, the, we, it's where everybody's going. Private enterprise hasn't stepped up to the plate. So how specifically are we going to get that? Okay. I'm a victim of this. Uh, we uh, do not have cable where we are, and we have a private company that stepped up here, a small company. In fact, they own the tower right down the road here, and we have better service now than we've, uh, most, most people have. Uh, they are fantastic service. We even put a tower on one of our buildings that uh, uh, is one of the relay towers for them, and I've seen it's cheaper and we do a, they do a much better job than any other service out there. Now, they're not countywide. Not yet. They're working on it. They're a small company starting up. We are one of maybe 200 uh, providers or 200 uh, service from that provider. But it is there. It can happen and it can happen cheaper. Now, it hasn't happened yet, but we have to open the opportunity up for them to do this. Thank you, Mr. Niner. I agree with the follow up. Uh, if you don't live in a municipality, you don't have the high speed technology. I live out on 482 on my family farm. I have dial up. I'm embarrassed to say that. I wish I had broadband or Something's a little bit more faster, but I make do with what we have. Uh, don't have cable because it's not ran out there to our house. Uh, we need to look at that, but uh, you were talking about private enterprises. If we're going to use private companies, I think we need to use local ones here in Carroll County to make sure we keep the money that we're spending on this into the local economy to support our local businesses. If, uh, a lot of times we get work done from out-of-state companies. I don't think that's right. I think we got companies right here in Carroll County, whether they're here in Hampstead, Manchester, Westminster, or where be it in Carroll County, we need to spend our money with our local businesses. It may cost a few extra dollars, but we're employing people right here in the community, keeping them with jobs. Right now, it's a tough economic time. 
Every place I go in Doorknock, a lot of people are unemployed right now. This may be a way to provide jobs for here in our community, and a lot of our local businesses supply people with jobs here from our community. They don't go out of the county, they don't go out of state, they keep people, they hire them from right here in our community. A lot of people right here in District 2 will get jobs from that. Uh, so like I said, we need to spend money locally, keep our money here locally in the economy, and make sure we're supporting our local businesses. I said earlier, local business, especially small business, is the backbone of our community. We need to work with them, and as county commissioner, I will have an open door policy where I can sit there and talk with our business leaders and talk with community groups. And one of the things, we need to have an open door policy where people can come, just like here tonight with the debate. Everybody in the community is here. we got a packed room. People are allowed to watch the meetings on TV. They're allowed to watch it live on the Internet. They need to have open door meetings where people can see. That, uh, email us, call us, Twitter us, Facebook us, and get the information here so everybody has a say. And like I said, uh, work with local companies and spend our money locally. Thank you. Our next submitted question, Maryland Route 140 in the Finksburg area has been referred to as the gateway to Carroll County, yet over the years the appearance, of, the appearance and road safety of the area has deteriorated. How would you address this area as a commissioner representing Finksburg, and what are your thoughts on ways to improve the appearance and road safety of the area? Uh, Mr. Weaver? Right? Yeah. Okay, that area has... Uh not quite the same as it used to be, but the Finksburg Area Group presented uh, uh, some unique plans that are taken as, re as uh, recommendations. Those recommendations used in future development, I think, can be used to upgrade that. It won't happen fast. Uh, it didn't get that way overnight. It's not going to change overnight. But as businesses come in, they change hands, we can give the recommendation that we start to uh, make a, a more pleasant appearance to it. I uh, also have uh, known talk to some of the people in that area, none of them have been, uh, nobody's gone to see them. Nobody's talked to them about making some changes there. They've been told that they should. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to move the, uh, a welcome area down right when you cross the bridge. Nobody has talked to the people who own the property about even uh, thinking of uh, making some changes, trying to upgrade things. It's, uh, it's a plan, but we have to get the commissioners, we have to get economic development involved, we have to go into that area one at a time and start asking you know, what their plans are, how can they develop it, how can they improve it. Uh, the county may have to help them with some of this, but most of them have not been approached to do that. Some of them have been told that they have to, but not in a fashion that they're going to respond to. So as commissioner, I believe we have to go out and talk to the individuals. We, uh, they have property rights, individual rights that they have to deal with, but we have to be able to uh, work with them in order to m make this slow changeover to upgrade that area. Thank you. Mr. Niner. I'm glad to whoever submitted that question I think is a perfect question. Actually, I was in Finksburg today meeting with business leaders and citizens right there in Finksburg, and that was the very topic they brought up today. One of the big issues they have is with the roads down there. It's, safe, or it's not safe when you're turning, especially during rush hour traffic. They were talking about making, making sure we have turn lanes where people can enter the businesses a little bit more conveniently without putting their families in harm's way when they're trying to cross during business busy road hours, see what we can do about the track for signals. Route 91 and Route 140 is pretty wide, so we can see what we need to do as far as lane structures. After the winter we've had, we, the road needs to be repaired. There's a lot of potholes, there's a lot of cracks. We need to spend money on trying to get uh, the roads in good condition so people can drive on them a little bit more easier. Uh, and when you drive into Carroll County, when you come to Carroll County, Carroll County is composed of family farms and small business. If you're coming off of 795 on the 140 and you drive into Finksburg, you're going to see small business. That's the backbone of our community. There's a lot of small businesses that are down there, and they, they thrive off of the 140 traffic that we have there. But in order to make that area better, we need to talk with the business leaders and the citizens there and get their input. Not somebody from Annapolis coming up and looking at a state highway. We need to talk to the local people there. And as uh, county commissioner, I need to work with people in the community and talk to the elected officials in Annapolis and the officials in the county. It's a state, two state highways that intersect there. Uh, traffic safety, personal safety is paramount, but we also want to make it safe so people can enter and exit those small businesses to help support them. Um, 
it's a it's a heavily traveled corridor. I think there's like 30 to 50,000 vehicles that go on that highway every day, depending on the time of the day, the day of the week. So that is a major concern in that area. But road safety and road construction is a primary concern that I would look at. Thank you. Our next submitted question. Should Carroll County taxpayers pay the attorney's fees for commissioners that defy the law and opinion of the court? And Mr. Niner, you're first. Well, I've said I want to put keep more money in people's pockets. Uh, I think it's a time and place type of element, but I think people should be entitled to have their own personal representation. Uh, I know there's a county attorney on board, but uh, if somebody does something, uh, I don't, depending on the issue, if it's something personal that they've done outside of office, I think they need to do and get a personal attorney and they should be paying for their own legal fees. Uh, if it's outside of the office, I think they need to pay for it. If it's something within the context of the position and it's something protected by the job, then I think they should work with the county attorney. Uh, I want to safeguard taxpayer dollars. I don't want it wasted. And I think it's a time and place element. Depends on the issue. Like I said, if it happened outside of the workplace, that's one issue. That individual needs to pay for it. If it happens at the workplace, then we need to see what the appropriate avenue is with that. And I think we also need to count communicate with the Ethics Commission. The county has an Ethics Commission. The state has an Ethics Commission. We need to talk with them and see what the appropriate avenue and the course of action is. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, most of these issues should be able to be handled internally. They shouldn't have to go to litigation. If we go to litigation, no one wins. And this has to be, hap I, I think I'm a perfect candidate to uh, make this happen, that we could work together to not get to this point. Uh, it, it's uh, not any, uh, no one will win in this situation. And I think right now we try to keep everything out of the courts. Every time we go to court, it, it, only one person wins or two people win, and that's the uh, legal representatives. So we have to get away from that. We do have the ethics commission to go to. We do have people to help internally. That's exactly who we, how we have to handle this. Internally, not out in the courts. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a moment now. Anybody who got comment cards, if you filled them out, um, we'll be taking those. So, if, or if you have other questions that you'd like to submit or you'd like us to ask the candidates, we'll be taking those. And the next question. As someone who has been involved in two major zoning issues in Finksburg, are you open to having more commissioners hearings in the evening so people do not have to take off work all the time? And Mr. Weaver, I think you're first. Definitely. Evening meetings make the uh, transparent government to more people. Uh, having the meetings only during the day, uh, a lot of people can't make those meetings. They really can't voice their opinion. Uh, there's nothing wrong with evening meetings. I think you should have uh, maybe every other meeting or even more. So, and this has to be, uh, we have to work through this as I get into office, but what I want to see is uh, transparency in government. It's open to everybody to attend. Certain issues become passionate to people. They need to be able to get there without taking off work. When the, as the economy as it is presently, we can't have people uh, take off a day. It depends on what they do, but they can't afford to miss work, yet they have some major issues that need to go before the commissioners. Uh, and here again, we need to be open accessible to all people in the community, and we have to be uh, available to them 24 hours a day. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Like I've said earlier, accessibility is my number one key issue here in the community. I told everybody they can contact me on my phone if they wanna do that, but a lot of people wanna meet with their elected official in person. Everybody cannot come to the county office building between nine and five when it's open because they have jobs. People need to be working so they can make money to support their families. When they get off of work, they actually have family commitments too. So as a full-time county commissioner, unlike my opponents who are not going to be full-time, I will work around the clock and make sure I'm here to serve the community and I will make hours that are allowable for people that are able to come and meet with me when it's conducive. And also we will announce ahead of time where people can come and meet publicly with us to make sure that they have the opportunity to voice their opinions in person by electronic means or whatever fashion they need to do. 
Thank you. I'd like to do a little follow up on that one as well because previous boards and I think even our current board of commissioners has attempted at times, various times, to have evening meetings and the engagement of the public is not as robust as it is for tonight's meeting and maybe you only end up with one or two people in the audience. So what would you as a commissioner do to engage the community and get them to come out to those evening, me evening meetings and express their opinions and, and voices on the issues? How are you gonna get the people there? And Mr. Niner, yes. I think one of the things we need to do, we need to appropriately advertise ahead of time, not wait until the last minute. A lot of the meetings that we have here in the community, we find out the night before the day of. Uh, we need to make sure it's advertised in the newspaper. Uh, Carroll County Times is one of the avenues that we can do to advertise or in the local newspapers that we have here. We have Facebook. Uh, the website needs to have it posted ahead of time so people can access it. We can email people, put out notifications. The community media center even has a, a station where we could advertise upcoming meetings and have that information out there to make sure uh, that, that information is communicated. I think um, we need to make sure citizens are well informed ahead of time and so they can make uh, time in their schedule to do that. If the timing's not conducive, then they, we need to work around the schedule to make sure they have the time for that. But appropriate and advanced notice is the main thing so people can participate actively at the meetings and come to the events that need to be discussed and the issues. Everybody has a right to participate. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, I'm all for boring government. That means no, one, no major issues, no one's really gonna come out. However, we need to set up a yearly agenda that we have way in, the, in advance. People know when the uh, evening meetings will be. They can plan for it. It's advertised everywhere that we can uh, uh, know which issues are coming up. We put it out way in, a, way in advance. We put it out through uh, uh, an alert now type system that everybody knows when we're having the evening meetings. And if it's dear to their heart or if it's an issue that they're passionate about, they will be there. But we got, have to provide the opportunity and way in advance. It can't be a last minute uh, decision to have an evening meeting. The, all these meetings have to be uh, set up in advance. Thank you. Based on all your previous statements, I could probably guess the answer to this one, but do you support a Carroll County transfer tax to increase county funds? Mr. Weaver? A transfer tax for what? To increase county funds. Okay, transfer tax. Every time a deed is changed, we would have a tax added to it. Um, it depends how it is used. We have to look at the budget to see what the need is for a transfer tax. We've had it in the past. Uh, I think we still have an adequate transfer tax. Uh, but it depends on what the rate is on that transfer tax and uh, if it's needed or not. Anytime we can cut government and cut government spending, we need to. We don't need to keep adding uh, uh, more taxes and everything. And that just adds to the cost of a home, adds to the cost of a property. If we can reduce it, I would love to. Thank you, Mr. Niner. I said before, I'm here to work to lower taxes and see what we can do to reduce those. I think there's a lot of red tape and a lot of regulation that hurts things here in the community. People are having a hard time thriving. When you put taxes on top of things, it cuts into people's pockets. They can't move forward with their lives. They can't support or has a hard time supporting their family and doing things here in the community. Uh, we need to make sure we can um, work to reduce the taxes, whether it's a transfer tax or any taxes, estate taxes or another thing, uh, and also any other type of taxes that we have here. Like I said earlier, I know we have to have a tax revenue coming in, but we have to use the tax dollars efficiently, effectively, and wisely. We need to monitor those funds, and I don't think increasing it is appropriate. Thank you. What is your position regarding the continuance of the Agricultural Preservation Program? Mr. Niner, you're first. Like I said earlier, uh, family farms are the backbone of our community. Uh, I'm supporting ag preservation. I think that's one way that we can preserve the family farms. Um, we need to see what's or what the reasonable amount is that we can offer here in the, the community as far as preserving them, what the time frame is and what we need to do to support them. I think what we need to do is have, have a public meeting with the local farmers and the citizens here in the community and see what their preference is as far as preserving their agricultural land. Um, I know as a, um, 
in my family, uh, like I said, I'm from a family farm, and one of the things we're looking at, too, is uh, handing down the farm each generation. It gets tougher and tougher. There's taxes that keeps people from having a family farm. A lot of times farmers actually have to sell part of their farmland or the whole thing to pay for their inheritance taxes. Uh, we need to see if ag preservation is the appropriate course, but I think it is. Uh, we need to preserve that farmland instead of building it up in the buildings and industrial space. Uh, I think we need to have a, a balance of businesses and also the agricultural uh, community here. And like I said, family farms, we need to work and preserve those. And I've worked on my family farm all my life and I helped my brother on his farm. And I think we need to do that. And it, it's a part of the local economy here. So we need to work in increasing the awareness of ag preservation and informing the farmers about those. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, there's 50,000 acres in District 2. Uh, 5,400 of those acres are in land preservation at the present time. Uh, I'm part of it. We have some of the farm in land preservation at the present time. Uh, in fact, we're on the side of a, a block of land, about 1,500 acres, that will be permanently preserved in ag preservation. Uh, it's, a, it's a valuable uh, tool to uh, take care of housing developments in the uh, rural areas or to keep that area in farming uh, in a, as a rural setting. Uh, you don't want to put a housing development next to a farm. They usually don't get along uh, for a long period of time, the first generation, but uh, different smells and odors can have some impact on them. So if we can keep large blocks of land in land preservation, we are assured that we're going to have open space. We're ensured that we're going to have uh, ground out there that uh, is going to stay an agricultural uh, entity. And if you look ahead to 2040, 2050, we have nine... Uh, billion people in this world to feed. We're going to have to come up and keep that land uh, preserved in agriculture. We are in one of the richest areas of the country, from Virginia through the center of Maryland up through Lancaster, uh, as far as some of the best land in the country. We need to preserve it. The way it's going, uh, we could develop everything, but we have to uh, uh, preserve that land. Now, 25,000 acres are in agriculture in this district, so we still have uh, 20,000 acres that could go in preservation. And it's a slow process, but it's a, definitely a valuable tool to help preserve and keep our county uh, rural. Thank you. What is your position on the town of Hampstead ignoring the comments of natural resources agencies regarding the Futch's North American industrial site development? Reference statements made by former Hampstead town manager to the Carroll County Times that natural resources agencies comments, um, DNR, et cetera, would not be considered. I'm not really familiar with that issue to the extent, but Mr. Weaver. Okay, uh, DNR issues are being ignored is what you're saying in Hampstead? Uh, apparently, yes. Okay. Uh, DNR, now I, I serve on the, uh, as an associate with the Soil Conservation uh, uh, District here in Carroll County, and I find it hard to believe that any of these uh, things would be totally ignored uh, and can be ignored. If we're going to develop any area, uh, DNR uh, presence, uh, soil conservation presence, uh, all the uh, land disturbance of over uh, 43,000 square feet is going to have to be addressed, and I uh, think that's going to be automatic in order to go anywhere with any kind of development. It has to go through all the agencies and uh, DNR does have a strong force and a strong voice in this country, in this county. Thank you, Mr. Niner. I'm actually a Hampstead resident, so um, I think we need to work with DNR. As the county commissioner, I wouldn't ignore what they have to say. I think we need to work hand in hand with them. It's a state agency. Uh, I work closely with the state government on a daily base, basis, so I'm more than willing to reach out to DNR and see what happens. I don't know if it was a private comment or if it was a public one. I just heard what you had said during the question, uh, but we need to work with them. DNR has a value in our community uh, and shaping the future of our community, but I also think our, we need to reach out to our citizens so they know also what's going on here in Hampstead and the other communities here in District 2. Uh, people need to be made aware of what's going on here in Hampstead and the other communities in District 2, but I'm here to work with anybody and I wouldn't ignore anybody's questions or comments. Uh, if they have a question or comment, they can talk to me anytime and I'm more than happy to let them know what my thoughts and uh, feelings are, but I would not ignore anybody's questions or comments that they have. Thank you. 
that segues nicely into this next question um, about dealing with government agencies and what is your position on smart growth, Mr. Niner? Well, I really don't think it's that smart. Uh, we need to work here in the community and see what we need to do. Like I said earlier about preserving the farmland here and having an equal balance between uh, what's going on here, making sure we have an appropriate amount of local small businesses, the family farms, and the way things are developed here in housing. People love to live here. Um, I think smart growth is the way the government's trying to nationalize everybody. I think the local community should be able to say how they want to live, what they want here in their community, how they want the roads laid out, and the structure of our community, what type of lifestyle we want. I don't think the government should tell anybody what to do. And like I said, smart growth is not smart. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weaver? Okay. Um, right presently, we have about 32,000 people in this area. Um, with 24,000 outside of the growth areas. Uh, we're projected to go uh, up by 3,000 in 2030. We're ex expected to go to 4,000 by 2040. We have to use here again a, a plan where we start working together to make all these uh, growth areas work uh, for the, everybody. We need to preserve farmland and we have to keep that in blocks. We have to kind of keep uh, some of the housing uh, also in blocks, but here again, this is an individual rights type thing. If I have a farm and I want to develop it and I haven't preserved it, I do have some rights here and we have to work together with the county in order to decide which way we're going to go. Uh, this is uh, a sensitive issue. We do have to provide or clean water. We have to provide sewage system for all, any houses going in. And it is uh, an issue that we may have to deal with down the road. So we have to start working together. And here again, long range planning is going to be the key to where we can uh, develop some of these areas and uh, not. If you look, most people want to put a house on the family farm. You get down two, three generations. They want to have a house there. One house is not part of smart growth. It's when you get a whole development coming in is really becomes uh, the issue. So we have to keep this kind of open. I don't want a, uh, a strict law prohibiting any type of uh, growth. Thank you. Our next question, what is your position, position on praying in Jesus' name at the opening of public meetings. And Mr. Weaver, you're first. No. Would you repeat that, please? What is your position on praying in Jesus' name at the opening of oh, okay. public meetings? Okay, I'm all in favor of prayer. Uh, this is one issue, though, uh, when we are elected as an official, you have a little different set of standards that we have to live with. And I think right now, here again, we have to decide what kind of issue we're going to deal with as far as uh, a group. I think we have to collaboratively get together and decide what our stand is on issues and develop those. I am not opposed to uh, prayer at all, but is, uh, we have to represent all people. We have to show tolerance. And that tolerance has to happen uh, from all elected officials. The tolerance is what... Uh, uh, I think you, you have a board of ethics you have to answer to, and we have to represent everyone, just not our in, own individual interests. Thank you. Mr. Niner? I don't have an issue with people praying. Uh, uh, our country was founded on religious freedom. It's protected under the First Amendment. Uh, I don't think it should be prohibited. If somebody wants to say Jesus or whatever their religion is, that's fine. I don't think anybody should be forced any religion, uh, a moment of silence is fine too. People can do what they want during that moment of silence. Uh, Congress even opens uh, the congressional session with a moment of prayer, um, and the leg state legislature even does the same thing. Uh, I think it's a, it's a public opinion issue, and I mean, personally, I don't have an issue with somebody praying. If they want to do that, like I said, they're protected under their First Amendment right, and we were founded on religious freedom. So I think we should do it before, before the session actually starts and as part of the opening. Thank you. <clears throat> this next question is probably better suited for our Board of Education candidates since they would be the ones making the determination. But in, I'll say it for, to you as well as candidates because since the commissioner is determining the funding levels for the school system and everything, what would 
would you or would you not support additional funding for the schools? Do you believe teacher salaries should be increased to compete with other surrounding counties? So is the question. So as the funding source for the school system, would you say put more money in school funding for an increase in teacher salaries if the school board asked for it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mr. Um, as far as increasing teacher salaries, I need to, we need to look and see what the appropriate amount is and see what other counties are paying their teachers. I know for a fact the number of the teachers I'm friends with, they've even left Carroll County because they can make more money in another jurisdiction like Prince George's County or Montgomery County. They'll make the commute from Hampstead all the way down to that community. Uh, I think we're losing great teachers because of the salary issue. I mean, they're here to um, provide a service, but they also have to earn a living too. So we need to look and see what the appropriate amount of pay is for teachers and see well, what is fair for them and see what we can fit in our budget. Uh, I think we need to do a, a deep analysis of that and see what's appropriate and pay them accordingly to the job that they provide. I mean, they're educating our students for the future and uh, it's a full-time job for them. It's just not during the uh, school hours, they go home and grade papers and they work long hours. So. We need to see uh, what we can do to help teachers out and what we can do to advance uh, the salaries if it's appropriate. But like I say, we, it needs to be comparable to other jurisdictions. Uh, so we're not losing the great teachers we had. I had a lot of great teachers. I'm a product of the public school system and graduated in 1996 at Carroll, or North Carroll High School and lived here in Carroll County all my life. I became friends with them. They're, some of them are even helping on my campaign and some of them have even left because they could get paid more in the county next door. So we need to see what we can do to keep them here in Carroll County. We want the best and brightest teachers here in our community. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. We have a great school system. We have a lot of good teachers. We're losing a lot of young teachers. A lot of them are thinking of leaving. I got a call uh, two months ago, a young man who we hired eight years ago, uh, did a fantastic job, just went to a school district in Pennsylvania, $20,000 raise. And they wanted him because he could teach our curriculum. They were that far ahead of where he was going. I hear this all the time. We have to get the pay scale up with the surrounding areas. Uh, you can go almost anywhere right now. And we can't attract young teachers. I know some of the teachers we're hiring today are not the caliber we had five years ago. And we have uh, to stay competitive. And our students uh, will pay the price down the road if we don't keep quality teachers. We need good young teachers. My son is one of them I want to keep in this county. He's doing a great job. He's an outstanding uh, tech teacher for the state last year. So I need to understand that you need to understand that in order to keep people here, we're going to have to pay uh, a comparable salary to the surrounding areas. And this is a critical area. They can't make it up all at once. They haven't had a pay raise in five to six years. So it's gonna to have to be a slow process. But uh, you know, I don't know when education got to be a bad word, but uh, we all depend on it and our kids are dependent upon uh, getting that good education. Uh, Billy, I think you got a good education. I got a good education in this system. I think a lot of people in this room got a good education in this system. We have to keep it strong and at the top. Thank you. I'd like to do a follow-up question on that one as well. We talked about education funding at the opening question. And again, the teacher salaries is something that's determined by the Board of Education or the school administration, which then comes to the county commissioners for funding. So what are you going to tell the Board of Education that they have to do? Do they have to come to you and say, we want $10 million so that we can raise salaries X amount? Or how is it that you're going to do that if you're watching education dollars and are limiting education funding, but you want to give teachers more money? How is that, how's that going to happen? And Mr. Weaver, can you start? OK, this comes from long range planning. We start ahead, way, down, way far down the road. We start working together with the Board of Education. They make the ultimate decision, not the commissioners. We cannot micromanage the Board of Education. That has to stop. We have to allow their funds, that we have to work together. What are you going to need? We have to find the funding to do that. I, it's there. I think I know we can find it. But we have to be able to work long term on it and not just within a, the budget 
couple months. Uh, they're going to have to start earlier making these decisions and how much money is going to be allocated. So it's no surprise at the end, and we have to uh, start cutting positions and cutting things to uh, get the money we want. Which is, it has to be a long-range, short-range and long-range goal set up, work together on a 15-year plan even, of what we're going to need. We have projections on enrollment. We have uh, projections on income. We should be able to put these together and get an idea of where we're headed. We have to work together with a, a vision, a common vision of where we're headed and uh, allow for teachers, how many are you going to need, uh, and deal with these issues. Long-range planning, collaborative government is the key to all of this. Thank you, Mr. Niner. I think the county commissioners actually need to work with the Board of Education but they also need to include the teachers. A lot of times the teachers are not included in those discussions. It's just the Board of Education and it's also just the county commissioners. Everybody needs to work together as a group. They need to come together and talk about it, whether it's the budget, teacher salaries, or any of the issues that affect education, and also making sure that we have the appropriate funding, see what is the realistic amount. That, like they always said, there's the real answer and then there's the right answer. So we need to work together and see what the appropriate thing is that we can have. I mean, um, fun funding's a major issue. It does cost money for education, but like I said, we need to see what the enrollment is of the students each year. We need to see how many teachers we need, and we need to sit down and have a, a comprehensive meeting. And I do think the teachers have to have a say in what we do and not just the Board of Education and uh, county commissioners, but I do think the county commissioners have a big part and they should have a say in what funding gets allocated as far as education. So, like I said, everybody needs to work together and instead of all this infighting that goes on currently. Thank you. Next question. Given that Carroll County is a bedroom community, response time for volunteer fire departments and ambulance service can become an issue during the work week. What steps might you take to reduce this problem? Mr. Niner? Carroll County is kind of a bedroom community. Uh, a lot of people uh, commute from Carroll County and work in Baltimore. Uh, emergency services is one of my biggest things as far as public safety. Uh, we have a great volunteer fire department in all of our communities. Uh, we have Gamber and Hampstead right here in our district. Uh, and they do a great job responding. Uh, people volunteer around the clock. I mean, during the daytime, nighttime. Uh, we need to see what we can do to help support them. I always tell people, make sure you go to the carnivals, buy the food there, play the games. All that money goes directly back to the fire department. I think it's a great place where you can take your family and have some fun, and then at the same time, you're helping the fire departments. Uh, we need to make sure we have the appropriate technology there as far as the fire trucks, the equipment they need, protective gear. We need to make sure they're safe when they go in there. Um, unfortunately, one day we'll have to call 911 and either for ourselves or a loved one, and we need to make sure they're there timely and make sure they have the equipment to save the people. Uh, we need to make sure uh, that's appropriately uh, supported. As a county commissioner, I'll work with the fire departments and go out to each of the fire departments and talk to them, not just at their pancake breakfast, but have a meeting where you sit down and have a round table and also include the citizens and see what their opinion is as far as getting an ambulance or a fire, to, fire truck to their house when, they're, when there's a fire or a life-threatening issue. Uh, we need to work with the uh, emergency services throughout the county. Um, that's uh, one of my primary goals, too, and they're a volunteer organization, and we need to see what we can do to support them. And as county commissioner, I'll work closely with them. Thank you. Mr. Weaver? Okay, I've uh, had, had this discussion with quite a few of the people with emergency services. Sometimes we are left uncovered in this county as far as uh, having fire services when we need it, having emergency services. So far, they've been able to work with the next uh, company, and we always have the coverage we need. Um, it, and it hasn't been an issue, but it's going to be an issue. As our population grows, uh, we're going to have to uh, address this. I did ask the firemen, once elected, that, I would, that we sit down together. You develop a plan on how we can come together to cover all these services uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, they were glad to hear that because I don't want to make a plan for them. I want them to make the plan that's needed to uh, cover all these emergency services on that 24 hour, 24-7 uh, plan. And they were glad to hear that. They wanted to work through it. I think we can uh, work as a, uh, a group here again. It's long range planning. 
you know, within the next couple years, the next 10 years, next 15, what are we going to need? So this is what we're trying to uh, work with. They were really receptive to uh, the idea that they developed a plan and then talked to us about it. Thank you. The next question sort of goes right along with that. Given that Carroll County is very close geographically to Washington, D.C., and D.C., as we know, has already been a target of terrorism, uh, what level of support would you give to our local emergency management community? Mr. Weaver, you're first. Our local emergency management, uh, I know we have MEMA right down the road here uh, to help us, but with this, this whole plan, uh, I, if we get the new sheriff in, we get the new uh, uh, emergency services, these, the communications issue is the key on this one. With D.C. that far away, or not that far away, we need to have uh, communication with all these agencies, fire, police, emergency services, all has to be tied together. And I think presently that has been a little bit of an issue. We've had uh, a different communication areas in order uh, uh, in each area, they have one system here, one system here. If we can tie this system all together, and here again, tie the school system into it, because they're gonna have to be alerted uh, to everything going on, upgrade those things. We do have some unique uh, opportunities now. We do have the, uh, the vans the, uh, that they can pull in and, see, and tie into the school system um, cameras to see every, everything that's going on in the school, and they can be up to a quarter mile away, I believe, at the present time in order to work. But this whole um, focus has to be working closely together with all of these agencies. Thank you. Mr. Niner? I think we need to work and support uh, local emergency management. Like I said earlier, as far as with the local uh, fire departments, and uh, the county sheriff's office, one of the main things is to make sure we have the appropriate technology, the protective gear that they need, and we also need to make sure we have the appropriate communication channels and make sure they can get through when they need, in times of emergency. You don't wanna be like on 9-11 when people are trying to call and then cell phones aren't working and phone lines. We need to make sure the technology's up to speed. They can make that phone call. Uh, every minute is very precious, especially if it's an emergency. We do live by Washington, D.C. It has been attacked before. And a lot of our people here at the fire departments, the police department, even went down and volunteered and helped those people that were injured and uh, their families and everything there uh, at the Pentagon and in other areas. And even some of our uh, emergency responders even went to New York City and helped the people there. We need to work together. Uh, I think public safety is a major thing. Uh, like uh, uh, down the road here on Route 30, we have Camp Frederick where MEMA is. Uh, we have the state agency right there almost in our backyard. So we need to work with them. We need to work with the state, federal, and local government and make sure there's a group effort and make sure there's appropriate communication. Timing is everything. We need to make, and I want to reiterate, we need the technology, communication channels, and we need to support our local emergency management, whether it's the fire department or any other uh, type of emergency services that we have here in Carroll County. Thank you. Mr. Niner, you'll be first this time. Uh, tell the audience, what is the, in your opinion, what's the one single issue facing the county right now that is most important to you? How are you qualified to fix it, resolve it, move it forward, whatever? And what specifically are you going to do to accomplish that? Well, I have several issues I like working on, but like I keep saying, accessibility to your elected officials is one of the main things. If you have, or like I said, my phone number is going to be there. I'm going to make sure I work around the clock to serve the community. I've got plenty of energy. I can do that. So being 36 years old, I can work around the clock with very little sleep. Uh, my friends and family know that, and sometimes I lose track of what time it is when I make phone calls a lot of times. Um, but if you don't have access to your elected official, you don't know what's going on. Uh, if you don't have access to your local official, you don't know what's going on as far as how they're gonna work to lower taxes, protect Second Amendment gun rights here in the community, um, and what they can do to help small businesses. So accessibility to your local officials is very paramount to me. I mean, if you have access to them, and when you can talk with them, meet with them, you can work with them on the different issues there. So that kind of encompasses all the issues when you have access and not just a special interest or anything like that, but citizens should have access to their elected officials so they can participate as far as the issues going on in the county. 
Thank you. Mr. Weaver? Okay, on a county level, I think the biggest issue we have is, according to dollars and cents, and I think the root of that is jobs and job enhancement. If we can get jobs and enhance the jobs we have in this county, we're bringing revenue in. Uh, small business needs to come in. Every town we have in this county has a place in the center of town that needs to be uh, developed, needs to be created to put more jobs in it. Uh, look at Hampstead in the center of town. We have some areas that we need to take, uh, and I've already talked to some of the town officials on this, and develop uh, business centers, bring business back to the center of some of these towns, uh, and in that case, we have to have jobs and job enhancements. High-tech jobs, not just uh, uh, minimum wage jobs. We have to uh, get jobs that are going to be uh, paying a wage. That also dictates everything in the county. Dictates the type of housing we need. It's going to uh, dictate the type of emergency services we need. If we can get the jobs here and we can enhance the jobs we have and work with each town or community, doesn't always have to be the town. This is a perfect thing for the downtown Finksburg area. We get a different business. We start to look at uh, some of the high tech businesses in. We can it filters down to the rest of the county. We can make a big difference in the whole county without raising property taxes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Weaver, you'll be first for the next question. Our current commissioners have passed an English only ordinance which requires all official actions and views coming from the county to be written in English. Do you agree with this ordinance or do you think that it sends a negative message to those who currently are just learning the English language? Please explain your thoughts. <laughs> well, we are America, and we, English is our language here, but we're a melting pot. I think, you know, English language, we have to have one straight language to deal with, and the fact that it's English, it should be English, but we also have to be sensitive to all people that are in this area. Tolerance is uh, uh, an attribute at this point, and we have to provide uh, access to people who don't speak English or don't speak great English, but uh, I like the fact that English is our official language. Thank you. Mr. Niner? Um, as far as English being the official language, it's already the primary language here in this country. Um, I think uh, we have to have some kind of standard as far as what we speak. Uh, when we go to a foreign country, they expect us to communicate in their language if they don't speak English. Uh, I think that's the primary focus here in our community. Uh, if somebody does not speak English, I don't think they should be turned away from getting assistance in the county office building or from their county commissioner. Uh, there's ways that we can help assist them also. We shouldn't be uh, uh, not serving somebody because they don't speak English. We have uh, technology there. Uh, the language line is one uh, avenue the state government uses. We can use that. And there's even an app on your cell phone where you can translate through that. Uh, and then it also breaks it down to English or the other language for the other person. We need to work with everybody, but I do think English should be the official language. This is America, and we need to be speaking English. Thank you. All right, Mr. Niner, you'll be first for the next question. The current commissioners have struggled with the issue of waste to energy. What is your position on the waste to energy joint proposal with Frederick County? And if Carol withdraws, then what is your vision for disposing of solid waste in the future? Well, the waste to energy issue, I think it comes down to the incinerator. I think it's a, a long-standing issue here in the county. Uh, personally, uh, I'm not supporting an incinerator here uh, in Carroll County at this time. Uh, I think we need to, have, there's other avenues as far as handling our waste. There's recycling, we can do that. Uh, at the Carroll County Landfill, right there on 140, which is in our district, they have a recycling center there. You can take your plastic, your cardboard, even your old used TVs, you can donate it. And they even have Goodwill there working with them. And uh, it provides a uh, work experience for employees there through Goodwill. Uh, I think if we recycle, that's a great thing to do. Uh, it's a way to reuse the waste that we have because a lot of it can be reused. Uh, uh, even, they even have recycling there for aluminum cans. You can go to a scrapyard and take your metal there and recycle that. And a lot of people don't know you can get a few cents for that. So that puts a little extra money in people's pockets for doing the right thing. But uh, I think we need to clean up the environment. Um, we, there's an incinerator in Frederick. There's an incinerator in Baltimore. I mean, it provides jobs with uh, transporting the uh, waste there. But I think we need to push recycling. I don't think the county is ready to spend that kind of money for an incinerator here. And I think it's going to be very cost, cost effective and very expensive here for Carroll County to put an incinerator in. So promote recycling 
A lot of times it doesn't even cost anything. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, there's some other methods out there that are, uh, I think, going to be presented to the uh, uh, co uh, county commissioners here in the very near future. Um, not a liberty yet to divulge those, but uh, we have to look further in the waste energy, waste management. I served on the Environmental Affairs Committee years ago, and uh, we started to look at all kind of alternatives. Uh, they didn't, I don't think, have looked far enough right now. There are some methods out there that we can uh, provide energy, we can provide a product from, and we can uh, do it cheaper than uh, with the incinerator only. In fact, the one... Um, method I'm thinking about takes 42 car loads of tra train car loads of trash a day to keep it going. So we may even be able to uh, pull, pull uh, trash in from other uh, uh, areas in order to get rid of it. So, and this would be a, a way that we could definitely uh, mine our landfills, uh, clean up the cells we have that we've buried. I think John Owens doesn't even have a, a liner under some of those cells. We can bring it back in. We can clean up most of these areas and maybe even make it profitable for Carroll County. Thank you. The stormwater tax or the rain tax has been highly controversial. Yeah. How would you work with municipalities to accomplish the goals mandated by the Environmental Protection Agency? And Mr. Weaver, I think you're first. Okay, yes, the rain tax is uh, a tax that um, I guess was unfairly put on Carroll County and some of the other counties. Our water goes into Liberty and Pretty Boy. We don't have much water going directly into the bay. Um, the tax has uh, presently been eliminated from, from us, but uh, as we start to uh, deal with the towns and our stormwater uh, management, we're going to have to work with each town. Every town has a different level of uh, uh, where they are in upgrading these systems. We're going to have to, as county commissioners, we're going to have to work with each and every town. We're going to have to set priorities on what town, what needs what what funds are available, and we're going to have to start working through each of uh, these towns one at a time in order to deal with this issue. It can't be something that happens all at once. We're going to have to work with uh, MDE and develop a plan with them. We work with them instead of just uh, uh, them dictating to us or we dictate to them. We start ahead of time and all work together to develop a plan to meet the clean water standards. And that's our, and we have to do that. Uh, if we, for our children, we have to maintain clean water. And that is going to be an issue in this county if we're not careful. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Um, what we were calling the stormwater tax in the newspapers, they called it the rain tax, and that's what everybody knows it as. It's an undue burden for Carroll County, and it's also unconstitutional. It did not apply to every single county. Carroll County got singled out along with some of the other counties. Uh, the rain tax was designed to help protect the bay. We've been working and spending money on that. Uh, I've heard people discuss different things about ways to do it. We need to look what's coming upstream from other states. And one of the main corridors of bringing water, in, or water and pollutants into the Chesapeake Bay is with the Conowingo Dan. We need to see what we can do to invest in that, see what we can do if we need to dredge it or clean up the contaminants. I think a couple of our county commissioners have already uh, talked about that at the MAKO conference. Uh, I think we need to look at that and see where it's coming from the other places. I don't think Carroll County should cover the burden for everything that goes on in the state. I think it's undue, it's unconstitutional, and like I said, it did not apply to every single county here in Carroll County. So, I, like I said, I'm not for more taxes. I will fight against taxes that are unconstitutional, and we need to look at other sources of pollutants. And I think there's a lot of states uh, north of Maryland that's uh, adding to the pollution in the Bay, and Carroll County, uh, a lot of municipalities even have uh, subpervious surfaces where uh, with drainage and stuff like that, they're putting better technology in as far as drainage and waste management. So, but I don't think the rain tax was fair, and it's it's just unconstitutional. And we need to look at other things for cleaning up the bay. Thank you. The next question sort of goes along with the last one. Apparently, uh, sea levels are rising in the Chesapeake Bay area through both additional heating due to climate change and land subsidence from the last ice age. Carroll County is non-contiguous with the Bay. What civic obligation do you see as Carroll County's responsibility? And Mr. Niner, you're first. 
Well, I think we need to not be polluting. A lot of times when we're driving around, we see trash along the roads. We have uh, organizations like our Kiwanis Club. We go out and pick trash up off the uh, state highways on 97 and 140. We make sure that doesn't enter into the waterways. A lot of our streams, they go directly into the bay or into another water channel that gets there. We need to stop it at its point as far as uh, pollutions and making sure we're not dumping stuff that's illegal and not safe for the environment. Um, I mean, I think pollution is the main thing we need to keep an eye on as far as uh, climate change and uh, the ice age and stuff. I think that's more of an international issue, but I think if we start locally as far as with recycling and making sure we're not dumping pollutants or trash and we keep our community clean, I think that aids, especially here in Carroll County, especially since we don't actually touch the bay, but we do have waterways that eventually enter into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, one of the projects when we were in high school, some of my co our fellow students even went around in Hampstead here on Main Street and uh, with green and white paint and said uh, no drain or no dumpage because it goes into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, that was a community service project that a lot of students did here in the community. Uh, I think a lot of our young people and are very uh, up to date on not polluting. Even the family farms, everybody picks on the farmers all the time, but our farmers here are good stewards of the land. I think they are, are very uh, strategic as how they preserve the land, how they work it, and how they uh, raise their crops and everything. There's no-till planning is one option, and also uh, putting in things where there's no runoff or anything. So uh, they put buffer zones in with plants and vegetation, so there's no runoff into the waterways. But we need to work and see what we can do to make improvements. There's always ways we can improve. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, we have a responsibility uh, to our children, to our grandchildren. We have uh, to leave them with clean water. We have to leave them with a way to get rid of the waste we have, the pollution. Uh, we have uh, education is the key to this. We started North Carroll, just got the uh, Green School endorsement. I think Century has it, Scott Key may also have it, but they're educating children what to do, what type of things we can do to um, uh, as far as water and as far as keeping things environmentally sound. Uh, if you look at, I mean, I've seen people uh, pull into the parking lot and dump drain oil, dr oil out of their car down the storm drain. Uh, it happens more than you think, but we have to take this responsibility uh, and start to clean up uh, these areas. Carroll County does not enter directly into the bay, but we have a responsibility to Pretty Boy, uh, Liberty Reservoir, uh, to all the streams going in to keep it clean as we we can. It took 200 years for us to mess things up. It's going to take some time to straighten it out. But through education, I think generation after generation, we get the students involved that they know what's right and what's wrong, and they adhere to it. We can make a difference. Uh, such things as Envirothon. Uh, education, where people are out working. Uh, these are all key areas that uh, we start to educate students on not to pollute, how to deal with uh, each of these items. And it's our responsibility, I think, as commissioners to take a lead. It's, it's also going to be uh, a joint agency responsibility for that education. Thank you. Next question. Billboards are considered a large part of what detracts from the appearance, appearance of the Route 140 and 91 roadways in the Finksburg area. Would you be agreeable to phasing out the billboards in this area using depreciation of the signs or some other method to compensate the landowners and sign companies? And Mr. Oh. Weaver? Advertising's big business, and billboards were a good way of advertising. In fact, uh, it's spring right now in an election year. You're seeing signs pop up everywhere. But um, billboards, uh, yeah, they're kind of, uh, you know, a little bit antique maybe. I think we need to have better ways to advertise. We can do with electronic billboards and buildings. Here again, we'll have to start looking ahead and planning for how can we keep up the advertising and not ha have the old antique or uh, a billboard and you know it's kind of distracting to driving and if you're looking at drivers now they're distracted by everything so um, I, I love some of the sayings on billboards and I, I'm, I'm guilty of being uh, distracted there but I think there's other methods we can get that message out especially with the technology we have thank you mr. Niner I think billboards are our main way for a lot of businesses to advertise uh, 
that like on 140, there's 20 to 50,000 vehicles that go by there on a day, especially during rush hour traffic. Um, it's advertising. It helps bring in uh, business to the small businesses in that community. A lot of times there's an arrow saying, hey, I'm here. Stop by and get your car fixed or whatever the business is right there. Um, I do think there is technology there. Uh, one of the things I like are the electronic billboards. There's one right next to the town mall there in Westminster, kind of uh, right across from 84 Lumber. There's an electronic one. There's a sign that rotate or changes electronically like every 60 seconds or whatever. So you can get five or six billboards on one and it keeps rotating. So everybody gets advertising. So it increases uh, the way you can advertise and it changes. If you keep saying the same thing over and over, you get so used to it. But if you have the new technology with those signs or the ones that rotate, it changes it. It catches people's attentions more. Uh, but I think there are more aesthetically pleasing ways to do it. And I think the electronic means are a way, but I do think it's a primary way of advertising for our small businesses. And I don't want to take away for advertising for those businesses. Thank you. The next question, the current Carroll commissioners have set aside $400,000 for an educational opportunity fund for those that homeschool or send their children to private or religious schools. Do you agree or disagree with the policy of using taxpayer money to subsidize these organizations? And please explain, Mr. Niner. Well, I believe in school choice. If somebody wants to send their child to public schools, if they want to send them to private school or homeschool them, I think that's their choice. It's the parents' right and their choice um, as far as how they want their, their child uh, educated. Uh, I know there is $400,000 set aside. Uh, a lot of times uh, people do need that money to help do it, especially if they're being homeschooled. Uh, if they get $1,000, a lot of times that'll save uh, or help with the expenses as far as making sure they get the uh, textbooks and the technology they need to teach their children. Uh, it saves them. Uh, I think if a lot of times in the long run, it may also uh, save money for the school budget. Uh, if people want to homeschool their children or if they want to send them to private school, that's their choice. Um, but I think everybody has a right to an education. If people are private or homeschooled, I don't think the government should be telling them how to do things. But I do think uh, some money needs to be set aside and there should be certain stand standards and parameters and application process as far as with that. But I mean, as far as earmarking it, we can look at it depending on how the budget is. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay, I think time will tell on this one, uh, see how it works out. But um, this opportunity fund, I mean, we have to get our public schools in line first uh, with everything they need. Uh, the opportunity fund uh, is open to about 9,000 students here in the county. Uh, and if all of them uh, opted to go into this, we would be very, we'd be short a lot of funds. And by doing this, I'm not sure we're not redefining public education here. So when those 9,000 people opt to go to a private school, uh, they pretty much opt to fund that education themselves. Uh, and until we have uh, excess funds to put into that, I would like to, uh, I think time's going to tell what we do with it, uh, give it another couple years and see where it goes before we make a final decision on it. Thank you. Given the current population of students attending Carroll County Public Schools has declined and is expected to remain low for some years, the current commissioners voted to not collect an impact fee from property developers at this time for education. Do you agree or disagree with this position and why, Mr. Weaver? Okay, our, uh, keep in mind a lot of businesses are struggling right now. A lot of small business, a lot of contractors are having some, uh, <clears throat> really feeling the impact of, uh, I guess, the downturn in the economy. The impact fee was added to the cost of a house. I paid mine on some of the properties we built, uh, but I'm a little bit torn right now. I think we're gonna need those funds eventually down the road. Uh, we're gonna pay now or pay later. Uh, they probably will come back eventually. Right now, we're gonna be at a deficit for a while, uh, but in, when building comes back, I think you're gonna see probably some kind of impact fee coming in and some, some of the things now we're struggling for uh, with schools in the, uh, uh, lack of impact fee uh, for the improvements we need. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Like I said, um, um, one of my things is to work to reduce taxes and fees. Um, I think um, the current population, like you said, is declining. A lot of the schools aren't even at 75% capacity right now. When I was a student, and like I said, I graduated in North Carroll in 1996, there was portables outside, it was packed. 
Uh, but the student population has shrank. A lot of the rooms are empty. Uh, I don't think the impact fee is a great way to go. All it does is increase the expense for homeowners when they try to buy a home or anything like that. It's just another a regulation and red tape that the government's imposing on people here in the community. So whatever we can do to reduce taxes and fees, I think we need to do that. And if we work with the budget we have and the tax dollars that are coming in, I think we can appropriately fund education here in Carroll County. Uh, I don't think we should have undue fees and taxes on people and we need to look at the uh, school system and see what the appropriate allocation of money is before we look at any fees or any taxes to fund that. Thank you. What steps would you take to expand public transportation within Carroll County while keeping the cost of that transportation within the realm of possibility for low-income citizens? Mr. Niner, you're first. Transportation here in Carroll County, we already have the CATS system. I see those uh, CATS fans all over the place, but I think one of the things we need to do is make the public aware. A lot of the CATS fans that we see are not filled to capacity. We need to make sure their routes are efficient and effectively used, uh, almost like Southwest Airlines, like they do. They have short hops and they make sure they have efficient use of those uh, vehicles that they have. We need to make sure that's looked at. Uh, I, I'm not in support of bringing light rail or metro here or anything like that, but I think the CATS needs to be there. It does help a lot of low-income people, and it's uh, pretty cost-effective uh, if you need to go to the doctors or if you need to go to the grocery store. I know a lot of seniors use that. They're handicap accessible, and we need to look at that and see what we can do to make sure the public's aware that that uh, resource is there and make sure there's an efficient and effective way that they can contact the CATS system so they can get on their route and make sure they get picked up and then explain how it's used and the appropriate use or maybe a way just based on your income that you can use it or see if there's uh, what's in the budget so we can help keep it affordable. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, CATS is very efficient, uh, very good transportation system. And I've noticed some taxi services uh, showing up in the county uh, lately. And here again, I want to put transportation out to private enterprise. I don't want it to become a county version to provide public transportation. I am not in favor of uh, bringing light rail into this area. It brings a whole host of other problems with it. But I think the uh, free enterprise will be the answer to our transportation system. Thank you. Our county commissioners, our current Board of County Commissioners has lowered taxes in recent years, giving homeowners a break, putting more money in their pocket, um, providing, them, providing for them. Um, but a large portion of the population doesn't own homes, own homes. So they haven't seen that windfall, big or small, or however, whatever size it may be. And the, the fact of the matter is, Carol is lacking in rental properties and properties that are affordable, especially now with the collapse of the housing market, it's harder to get loans and everything. Kids graduate high school, they go to college, they leave, not a lot of them come back because they can't afford to. What can or should the county government do to make sure the kids can stay in Carroll County or they can come back once they've gotten their college education? And Mr. Weaver? Okay, um, the type of housing in Carroll is dependent on affordability uh, and the creation and the type of jobs we have in this county. Uh, I know uh, young teachers coming in this county can't afford much, can't afford a place to rent uh, for what they're making. It's taking a, a one of their paychecks or maybe paycheck and a half in order to pay for rent. Uh, and this is an issue that we have to deal with. Um, I am. Here again, uh, I am a landlord. I do have some properties uh, that I do rent, uh, and I try to keep the uh, keep it as affordable as we can. But we have some things out here uh, fighting you tooth and nail on that. And I know we have lowered taxes, uh, and we can continue to lower taxes and get some efficient government going. But we do have to have uh, some ways in order to attract. Uh, uh, housing and one of the issues I go back to is the economic development for some of these in small towns if we can do the say a block where we take 
a whole block and take that area, put stores in and businesses that are affordable. Above that, we do go with a, a type of affordable housing that people can live in town, shop in town, bring the populations back into town and develop some type of uh, economical housing for uh, that beginning teacher. That I think one way to get people more encouraged to live here in Carroll County is to have a lot of the uh, upfront costs that they have to do just to even buy a home, see what we can do to reduce that. I know a lot of people, my brothers are younger than I am and trying for them, for, for them to try to get a home, the upfront costs just to even build a house, the fees and all that stuff you have to go through is making it burdensome on them. I mean, they're just either getting out of the military or they've been working career wise and they're trying to support a family. It makes it expensive trying to have those upfront costs. I think you need to make it affor affordable as far as uh, getting your permits and all that stuff that goes on with the county government. Uh, another thing we should be promoting, everywhere you drive around here in the community, you see a lot of real estate signs. There's a lot of vacant, empty homes that haven't been sold yet. We need to look and see what we can do to help sell those. A lot of times that's more affordable for people. The house is already structured and they don't. It, sometimes it'll uh, cut down on some of the fees they have as far as moving into a, a house that's already been construction or constructed. It helps with the realtors here in our community to sell the homes. Uh, interest rates are pretty uh, reasonable at this point in time, but uh, also we need to make sure we have jobs here in the community and they're uh, prepared to have the jobs that uh, pay the amount of money that they need. Uh, it is a little bit pricey to live here in Carroll County, but a lot of people uh, work hard for their money and then they the house is an investment for them and they work here to live, live and work hard here. Carroll County is a place to work, live and play like the uh, slogan says on the website. Thank you. Sort of as a follow-up to that, because you both touched upon it, um, the topic of you know economic development, bringing jobs that pay enough to keep people here. Uh, you're not the first candidate who said we've needed to do that. You could go back probably 20, 25 years, and pretty much everybody who's run for office said this is something we need to do. We need to improve our economic base. We need to improve our business base. We need to bring in businesses and things. Yet when we come to master plans or county plans or other things, they, they get voted down or people don't want them or whatever. What specifically can you do to bring those jobs and those businesses that are going to keep the 50 some odd percent of the county that not, workforce that now leaves the county every day to keep them here working every day? Mr. Niner? Well, one of the things, uh, there's a lot of regulations and red tape with small business. Uh, there's a local uh, auto place uh, down in Finksburg. I talked to them today when I was going around and talking to small business leaders. They want to put an addition onto their business, but there's so much red tape and regulation just to add an extra bay onto their uh, automobile mechanic garage that they have. And if they're able to add that bay on, they can hire several new people to get jobs. That's a new job creation with that. I mean, the property's already in existence. They have plenty of room, but just to add on for that is one of the things that's uh, holding them back, and that's with the permits and the regulations the county has. Uh, there's a new funeral home that was trying to get uh, all kinds of paperwork done just to get established. They've been in business for 150 years. They had all kinds of red tape. They had to provide plans. The county asked them what they do. I mean, a funeral home's pretty self-explanatory, especially when they've been in business for 150 years. I mean, they spent a lot of money just to be able to get the paperwork done and get the designs out. That was an undue cost of probably twenty to $30,000 based on my private conversations with them. That's money that could have been used to hire somebody to work there at the funeral home. Uh, like I said, Carroll County needs to be more business friendly, make it more uh, effective for people to do business here. Uh, the red tape's the big issue right there. The fees and anything just to start up or to expand. Um, some of the restaurants, even one there on 140, when they came there, uh, they were only allowed to have a drive through and people could walk in. They weren't allowed to have tables until they were there for so long. Well, most people want to go in a restaurant and sit down and eat and enjoy the meal with their family. So they made them wait a year or two before they can even get tables. So by the time they got their tables, the business was getting driven into the ground a little bit. If they had the tables there, I've talked to the different people that worked there. They said if they had tables where people could sit in, that would have created more jobs because you hire waitresses and hostesses for the restaurant. So it's just simple, common sense solutions. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay. Economic development needs to be held accountable. I know we've had to, in the past people say they want to do things. I want results. 
I want to hold people accountable to bring business in. We have some good training in this county. We have a tech center that's one of the top in the, probably the top in the state, even nationally. They do some fantastic training. They can add programs to train our young people for the skills out there. And they're not just bottom line jobs. Some of these are high tech jobs they're training. Their uh, programs there are some of the best in the country. We have a community college willing to add training to almost any program to enhance jobs that we have. These things are all there. We don't take advantage of them. We need to go out uh, and actually hold people accountable. I want to see X amount of businesses by this date. Entrepreneurship, help them start up. And as Bill uh, alluded to, we do have a lot of red tape. We have to streamline government. We have to cut a lot of the red tape out, make government efficient. And one of the things I'd like to see is when we go to government, we hold one person that you deal with in that government, not going from 20 different people to get the answer you want. A person's assigned to your job. If your business is being uh, expanded, that's the person you deal with. They get the answers. They need to be there to help you get through the end of your job, not create roadblocks for you. And here again, a, a economy or a, a government is there to help the people not run their lives. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take a deep breath. Uh, you reach that point where you'll each be given an opportunity to give a two-minute closing statement. And Mr. Weaver, you go first, please. Who? Mr. Weaver. Okay. All right. You know what I'm about as far as uh, running for uh, a county commissioner. People want safe communities, a top-notch school system, a good infrastructure. By working together uh, each, with each agency, sharing ideas and coming together with a shared vision, we can keep Carroll County strong and economically sound. Um, common sense government is what I'm about. We go in, we problem solve, we come up with an answer, and this is collaborative government. We all work together uh, to get to the final end. I know on June 24th, you have to get out and vote. You need to vote for Richard Weaver, commissioner. I believe in common sense government. Uh, when you go to the polls or early voting, vote Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Niner. Okay. As a lifetime Carroll Countyan, I'm the only candidate that has a heart, work ethic, energy, and desire to serve the community as your county commissioner. I didn't wake up one day just to run for public office or serve our community. I've actually been doing it my entire life values that my parents instilled in me as a child. I've also been endorsed by Senator Larry Haynes and Delegate Tanya Shuo, who know that I am the most qualified person for county commissioner and that I have the energy and skills to lead our community. A lot of candidates talk about their feel-good stuff instead of talking about the issues and where they stand. I actually put mine in print. After all, when you get elected to office, you actually have to work on those issues. That's why I published mine. I will be accessible to all citizens, work to lower taxes, protect your Second Amendment gun rights for protection and hunting, and stand up against Common Core. I will work to find solutions for our small businesses and family farms. Just like Niner Road in Gamber, it's a road that connects the county road, Deer Park, to uh, Route 32, which is a state highway. As a county commissioner, you're supposed to be a link for the county government and the state of Maryland. I'm here to be your link Make sure your voice is heard here in county government and also in Annapolis, and I'll function just like Niner Road, connecting the county and the state. Uh, I want to make sure people's voices and values are heard within the county and also in Annapolis and in any other level of government. For more information about the Niner for Commissioner campaign, you can go to my website at www.ninerforyou.com or feel free to call me, like I keep saying during the forum tonight, 443-536-1408. I always enjoy hearing from you, the people here in Carroll County. Finally, I would like to ask you for your vote on Election Day. I have the energy and the skills to serve you and lead Carroll County as your county commissioner. So let's get on track with Niner for county commissioner. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of you for answering all of those questions tonight. It's difficult with only two candidates. Some of the other forums that we have planned will have more candidates discussing. Um, we've got, I think, every question that somebody submitted just about was in, the ones that we had submitted online, the ones submitted to the League of Women Voters, pretty much all of the ones that were submitted 
got asked and, and you all answered them. So with that, I will turn it over back over to Claudia Lewis. And I want to personally thank you for your thoughtful answers because we did put you on the spot with only two commissioners and so lots of questions. Um, I wish you good fortune in the upcoming election. I want to express my sincere thanks to Mr. Lee um, for serving as our moderator. And I want to thank the local citizens and the members of the league for serving as timers and card collectors, questioners, that kind of thing. I'm particularly grateful to the Community Media Center for their hard work and their efforts. And Ms. Sherry Taylor has just been amazing. I want to thank WTTR 1470 AM for their support and for their broadcast of this. And a special thanks to the North Carroll Senior Center for providing us uh, the spot to host tonight's forum. Carroll citizens should be aware of the electronic voters guide, which will be available with the candidates' responses after April 25th. That site is www.vote411.org. That is listed on the Community Media Center's um, website, and it is also listed on the Carroll County Times website. Um, I did have an, a question from someone in the audience about Mr. DiMaggio, and would he have an opportunity to answer these questions and address these questions? He will have the opportunity to answer the questions on the Vote 411. I'm not certain that we can ask him to find a way, but perhaps we can. We'll work on that. Tonight's District 2 Commissioner Candidates Forum will be rebroadcast on cable channel 19. The first broadcast will be Wednesday, April 9th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, it will air also on Thursday, April 10th at 9 a.m., at noon, and at 7.30 p.m. The forum will also be available for viewing on the Community Media Center's website at www.carolmediacenter.org. WTTR 1470 AM will also rebroadcast the program on Sunday, April 13th at 10 AM. Thank you all for caring and coming tonight, and have a good evening.